Welcome back to the Crafts Jackpot Fantasy Football Podcast. It's sort of like a week two, week three-ish thing because I got lazy and didn't end up doing it last week, which totally my bad, but no one was pressuring for it. So I don't think you guys super cared since this is a cathartic, methodical thing I do for myself. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to cover today since I have your ear. Uh, we'll go back. We'll cover week one. I'm a little salty about the loss to Mick, but you know, whatever. If you listen to the week one thing, you'll know all about why I was, uh, very confident. And then just to get kicked in the nuts prior to the season starting, or I mean, you know, as soon as the season started, I should say, um, but we've got some standing shifts this week. We've got, uh, two, two and O teams. We've got some two O and two teams, and then everyone else just kind of vying for, uh, spots three through eight on the roster here. So why don't we hop in and take a recap for week one? Um, we had Camper Dude over Thrice Crown Menace. We had Will a New Name help with the most points of the week and our first week $25 winner over Blood Brothers, who still needs to change his name. Uh, we've got Kickers of People 2 with a win over Bone City. We've got Hans Bowman with a win over Pontiac Bandits. And we've got Fuket going deep over Hunter Biden's laptop. Um, for me, kind of the most devastating loss of that week was the uh, Pontiac Bandits losing to Hans Molman. I, I thought Pontiac Bandits team actually put up a really good fight. It was a super underrated matchup for him. Um, getting 29 points out of Jacoby Myers was just fantastic. Um, but Christian McCaffrey and then Aaron Jones against the Bears. That's what makes it very devastating for me. Jones put up 26 points because he had 86 freaking yards, a rushing touchdown, a receiving touchdown, and a whole bunch of yards in the air too. So uh, a double hit for the Bears that week and uh, 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 just a low blow for Gav too that week. Um, in week two, things were were very different. Like I said, we had a lot of teams that either lost that first week or won the first week, win or lose, because we've got more people with a tied record than anything else uh, in the league. So we've got, uh, and I mean, yeah, obviously this is how it's going to shake out week two. Cause mathematically, I think it has to shake out like this. Uh, but we had thrice crown menace over will a new name help with most points of the week. A thank you. 174.32. We had blood brothers not playing a player, which we'll get to in a little bit beating Hans Molman. Now the official noted story on this is that he felt like Hans Molman needed some sort of an advantage to to beat him this week he was that confident or he was busy fishing with his daughter one of those two stories is right and i'll let you the audience decide which one of those two is correct bone city pulling out that win over pontiac bandits who just uh now oh and two for ryan and brett goes one on one with that we had camper dude with a another victory this week over hunter biden's laptop somehow mick always finds a way we all know that he's a dirty rotten rat uh we got kickers are people too with 150 to 110 over Fuka going deep. Uh, so Nick Nick gets his uh, second win of the year here as well. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as matchups go here, I think, you know, the closest matchup was Hans Bowen and Blood Brothers, right? But I'm not really looking at it quite that way. I think the most devastating loss of this week is Peel to me. Uh, his team put up 128, which is the third most in points for the week. You know, he only loses to one other team. Those are tough. Like when you either lose to potentially just one or two other teams, those are tougher losses. Um, and it was also the biggest margin of, of victory too. There's a 45 and a half point uh, differential between that two. So it just goes to show a big boom week for me, just a bad luck week for Peel. Peel could have been 2-0 and here as well, um, but but falls to uh, just one and one here on the year in third place, sit, sitting in third place here. Um, that having been said, let's look at the standings here. I'm going to just in week two, what I would rather do rather than do points for is point out points against, because I think that's going to be a bigger indicator on like who's lucky and unlucky at this point. Spoiler alert. I get it. We're all lucky. It's fantasy football. And like, there's no rhyme or rhythm to a lot of what we do, but through two weeks, it's really hard to analyze. I think like, oh my God, these guys are so great. Cause like you saw T Higgins went for zero points in week one and then the practically 30 in week two. So it's like, what are we doing here? Trying to evaluate stuff like that. Um, right now points against on kickers or people too, is just over the 200 mark camper dude 
uh, has the least amount of points scored against in the league. So he sits in second place. That's a good stat to, to be up against. Will a new name help has 250 against, uh, which is about league average, somewhere a little bit below that, um, I think is, is right around league average. And that's because the points against to Mick are dragging everything down. Mick has, on average, about 50 points less than any other team. Uh, 258 against Thrice Crown Menace, 234 against Hans Molman, uh, 248 against Fuka Going Deep, Bone City 210 against, Blood Brothers 263. That's the highest point total against. Uh, and he's fighting by staying in a one on one record, mind you. Uh, Pontiac Bandits at 262. So just right there, he's at 0 at 2. He's just been unlucky uh, there, which kind of round this out and show the eight and nine stat after this and then 234 against hunter biden's laptop 199.4 uh the lowest point total in the league does not go to carlos it goes to blood brothers blood brothers has the most points against and the least amounts of of points in the league and sits at a one-on-one record i just thought that was interesting because i i didn't i mean mathematically obviously possible but improbable for that to be the case so just a fun little thing to look at also blood, blood brothers with no moves on the year. So just very confident that his team will do it. So confident that he won't even play a player because that's how confident he is in his team and wins. So like, who am I to debate whether or not that's the right strategy, right? Uh, we have the same record, the exact same record. We're one win or loss away from being separated here. Speaking of blood brothers, let's, let's go into this week's upcoming matchup uh, of blood brothers versus strikes crown menace. Uh, now, on this particular matchup, I've got no surprise here. I'm always going to do this. I got myself winning this one. Um, Jalen Hurts is my QB2 on the week versus Tampa Bay on Monday Night Football. I love that. He is playing a primetime game. Josh Allen, who struggled, is going up against a Washington defense, who's pretty darn good. But I also think that Josh Allen has like a massive bounce back game here. So I don't really have the QB2 and QB3 separated by a lot in point differential. We're talking like a point here. So. Uh, very, very, very slight advantage in my direction. Um, Chris Godwin against Philadelphia Eagles. I don't love it. I got him ranked a little bit more towards WR22. So he's like sitting at that very bottom of the WR2 territory. Calvin Ridley against Houston is a juicy matchup. He's going to be due for a bounce back week. I like Calvin Ridley there. Keenan Allen against the Vikings. That's going to be a shootout. It's a 12 o'clock game. So Kirk Cousins should be on form because he's not showing in prime time. Um, and Drake London on the opposite side of the ball against Detroit. Now, here's my thing. Detroit's defense is, like, looking legitimately pretty good this year. Uh, at least it did in week one. Week two, maybe not as much. That having been said, I love the talent for Drake London. I hate Drake London this year and last year and probably next year. Don't – I don't like – nobody should like an offensive system that's only going to produce three to five targets for their top guy. Like, it's – it's not a good situation for a highly talented wide receiver like this. And Drake London is highly talented. I just hate that he's buried in the Falcon system. Um, B. John Robinson, generational talent going up against Detroit. He's going to run all day long. I expect all the points to go to him. Um, Pacheco against Chicago. Interesting matchup. I mean, I got him ranked relatively low, all things considered. Normally, I wouldn't be playing Pacheco, Barkley injured. Also, I want to complain about the amount of injuries I've had all year, but we'll get to that when I get to the bottom of the roster here. Um, so I like Bijan over Pacheco, and uh, right now I'm just kind of like trying to figure out my RB2 this week. So right now I got Javante Williams in there against Miami. Uh, Miami allows a lot of points to running back so far this year, but Josh Jacobs against Pittsburgh I think is a, a smash spot too. So Josh has got two really good running backs. Uh, here, David Njoku against Tennessee versus TJ Hawkinson at the Chargers. Give me TJ. Uh, T. Higgins versus Brandon Cooks. Uh, I, we don't know if Brandon Cooks is going to play or not, but we do know that J that Zach is going to be bothered to move him out of his roster. So I love T. Higgins in this situation. Um, Amari Cooper is a little tough to, we'll, you know, we'll see how practice goes, but like he put up 16 points last night after aggravating his groin injury prior to the game on Monday. So he got sat, but he put up, you know, like I said, 16. So I, I like Amari Cooper over Jahan Dotson against Buffalo because Tennessee's not going to stop him from doing it. And then Buffalo's D against the Giants D, uh, if I even decide to keep the Giants. Okay, here's what I'm up against injury-wise. We're all hitting injuries. And by the way, in all seriousness, the Chubb injury was was awful. We all know that. 
uh, Mick, if you do end up listening to this, which I will encourage you to do, that sucks, man. I, I can't, you know, you're excited about a player and then you see him doing really well. And that happens in game two and it's a season ending injury, probably unfortunately a career ending injury for a, a very special talent. Um, that just blows. It's a, it's, it's part of the reason I hate fantasy football, uh, is stuff like that. Like the real life implications, stuff that comes out of it, but you guys will hear that on, uh, other podcasts you care about. Not so much this one. Um, now to complain a little bit, Javante Williams with a hamstring injury, uh, I'm sorry, Jamal Williams. I have Bull J. Williams on my team. Uh, Jamal Williams with a hamstring injury, can't play. Saquon Barkley out, so I was looking for someone to fill. Was going to be Jamal Williams. Uh, Deontay Johnson hit IR. Um, you know, I do I do have, you know, Zach Moss and Rashad White and some other options. I don't like Rashad White against Philadelphia's defense. I don't like Zach Moss against Baltimore's defense. P. Ryan's not the guy. Um, they're splitting. I do have Jerome Ford against Tennessee, so I'm kind of, tinkering around with the idea of potentially putting him in um, instead. So it, it, it'll be, it'll be something that I have to sort of figure out is what to do with the running back two spot this upcoming week. So interesting matchup, but the point total I have is 127 to 115 in my favor. Um, and we'll, we'll see what even happens if uh, you know, cooks plays this week too, what Zach decides to do, if anything. So I did kindly remind Zach to play somebody in all seriousness. The, uh, the next matchup we've got is Hans Mullen versus bone city. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, QB1, Lamar Jackson, I think is going to have a good week against Indianapolis. Um, I expect him to run a lot more this week too, uh, especially because they're, they're at home. Um, you know, it should be, should be a very good game for both those quarterbacks, but you, you can't, it's Patrick Mahomes against bears. Like, what are you going to do? He, he's going to, he's just like the planet is in jeopardy of exploding because of all the points he's going to score. So you can't stop him. With the, the Bears are the worst team in the league, bar none, hands down. We've proven nothing that we're not better than, and we wasted and sputtered all offseason. I had the Bears under six wins this year, and that was winning the first two games. So I have them at four wins now. Uh, and I'm still wearing their, I bought this hat. Like I was happy to buy this hat because I love showing everybody how miserable I am. The closest matchup for me of this week is CD Lamb uh, at, Arizona versus uh, AJ Brown at Tampa Bay. I give the slight edge to CD lamb with Arizona because Arizona is so bad, but like somehow they're actually like competing. Um, and, and AJ Brown is just so good. It's also AJ Brown Monday night football. So like, I think we're going to get a lot of AJ Brown, uh, uh, like a mini bye week for him. It's just so tough, but. Six and five for me on that. I give the slight advantage over to CD Lamb on that. Devontae Adams and Jerry Judy. Um, I, I think Devontae Adams is super good. I I don't love the situation that he is in right now on um, you know, on on the on the Raiders. Um, and I don't I don't know how much. I don't know if the shoe has dropped yet for Devonte Adams, which is tough to say because he's so good. But I love Devonte Adams over Jerry Judy. Um, Jerry Judy against Miami. I don't love that matchup. Um, Brian Robinson uh, against Christian McCaffrey is a no-brainer. You're talking the RB1. Now, Christian McCaffrey's on a short week, so we're going to see him primetime Thursday night against the Giants defense, who is just awful. awful. So, like, spoiler alert, I have Jeff winning this matchup, but I have the Jeffs winning this matchup, but slightly, just very slightly. Uh, DeAndre Swift, this was the biggest surprise to me all of last week. We knew, I think everybody knew what Swift is capable of. My, my biggest concerns or your biggest concerns is that can he stay healthy? Um, the answer is probably no, but like with the way he played, how do you not feature him? I, I just don't, how do you not feature him as the back? And Miles Sanders struggled this week too on the Jeff side of the ball, uh, I put I put some money down on the game. I was very disappointed that Miles Sanders couldn't put up, you know, what was it like sixty four and a half was a line or something like that. He couldn't do, uh, and that was like total yards, not just not just rushing yards. So, poo on him. Um, give me give me Swift in that. I like that better. Darren Waller and Dalton Kincaid. Now, the Dalton Kincaid thing is interesting because I I had him. I love Dalton Kincaid. I've I have shares of him where where like dynasty would matter in a lot of places, but that's not we don't talk about other leagues in this podcast, except for when I accidentally do. 
Uh, but I love I love the talent of Dalton Kincaid, and I love the fact that they're using him or will continue to like grow him in. First year tight ends just don't generally do very well. I like Darren Waller a lot because he's the only target that they're really going to throw to. Um, but Thursday night football against San Francisco is not great odds. So I, I like I like Waller more than Kincaid. Washington's pretty good defense against the tight end. Metcalf and Madison. I mean, Metcalf for me. Uh, Mike Williams and Hopkins. I just like if Hopkins can continue to get peppered by targets, then sure. But I think Mike Williams better play against Minnesota that Minnesota tends to have the other team air out the ball a little bit more. Um, and then I guess I won't do defense here because we're looking at Tampa Bay's defense. New Orleans probably flex that out or do something else with it. Um, so give me, give me the Jeffs in this one by two points. Uh, Mick and kickers are people too. So this is our, this is our two and O matchup. One of these teams is walking away with a losing record unless they die, which, you know, sure might happen. Um, David Montgomery is dealing with a thigh bruise. David Montgomery, by his own admission, said that he's not going to be playing. It's like a multiple week thing. And they refuse to mark him as out or put him on IR or anything. It's a it's a bruise. So I don't think it's going to be an IR situation. We're probably looking at two to three weeks before he comes back. Kirk Cousins is having a very good year. Two Tung- Tung of Iloa is having a very good year. I I actually like uh, to a, a little bit more than I like Cousins against Denver, but I have them both inside my top ten. Um, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. I mean, WR two and fourteen, and that's crazy to say for the one and two on their own respective team. I like Hill more. Uh, DJ Moore versus Chris Olave. Chris Olave gets Green Bay. I like that more than DJ Moore at Kansas City with Justin Fields right now, who's just not looking like the guy. And I have a lot to say about Justin Fields, which I'll get to as well. David Montgomery, I don't think he plays uh, Derrick Henry in that one. Gus Edwards, I like this pickup from Nick a lot, actually. I think uh, uh, Gus Edwards, um, they've generally liked him in the past, but he said his own injury stuff. That having been said, James Cook is looking pretty, pretty tasty against Washington this week. Uh, Travis Kelsey, I don't even need to say who's on the other side. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster versus Mike Evans. It's Mike Evans for me. And then Tyler Lockett over uh, uh, Josh Reynolds. Um, you know, I, confusing for like, well, not confusing. Okay, let's just, I will I will point out that Mick continues to hang on to five tight ends and I'm going to move on with my day. Uh, also, Mick, you know, puts Nick Chubb on his bench instead of dropping him. He's out for the year. And uh, Mick, just a very friendly reminder, you have an IR spot you can utilize and get an extra roster spot out of, but don't waste Nick Chubb on your IR spot because he has been ruled out for the entire year. Uh, as of like last night, ruled out for the entire year. So like the day the injury happened, they said he's done. Hunter Biden's laptop and will a new name help? Uh, Joe Burrow is questionable to play in this game. He is not looking right this year. So I don't know, um, but he did tweak his calf during the game. Um, and they, I don't think Cincinnati really understands what they're dealing with at this point. So it's, it's alarming. I would, I would, I would raise the alarm bells here for Joe Burrow on a Monday night game. I think you might have to put in somebody else. And there are, there are a few starters I would stream this week. Um, Justin Fields at nine, right? Cause like maybe they'll design more than four runs for him. So I guess I'll take the opportunity to go through here and go side by side. Justin Jefferson over chase. Here are the WR1 and the WR8, and Chase is faded because of quarterback situation, not because of the talent. Stefan Diggs is the three. Pittman's the 24. Uh, Walker is the eight, and ETN is the six for me. Uh, Khalil Herbert's the 30th, and Pollard's the two, so no brainer there. Uh, Hunter Henry is like risen a lot in my tight end rankings, but he's outside the top 10, but so is Tyler Higby. Devontae Smith is inside my top wide receivers. And I don't even, I don't even like that. I'm doing this, but he's shown me that I'm wrong in my evaluation. But uh, uh, LA has a new running back right now until Eckler can get healthy and it's Kyron Williams. And he played really well. So I've got Kyron as my or my uh, RB 12 for the week. Um, I don't think Carlos really has a, a solution for his, I'm sorry. Carlos has a solution for the, uh, wide receiver tight end uh and uh, running back flex spot because right now he's playing curtis samuel who i don't know i mean against buffalo i wouldn't do it but uh, on the other side of the ball you got raheem mostert so and then peel has the best defense in the league with dallas um it is it is like as as a 
he would finally say a cheat code. So I've got Peel winning this by by an arm and a leg. It's uh, 132 to 110. Let me get back to Justin Fields. I just want to be on the record for everybody here. I'm, I'm a Bears quarterback defender first and foremost. I'll bet you're missing Jay Cutler now. You guys give me shit all these years for liking Jay Cutler as much as I did, and I don't think he was a moving heaven and earth kind of a quarterback, but good Lord, he looks better than what we've been dealing with since we got rid of Jay Cutler. Let's think of all of the quarterbacks that we had since we we had that long neck quarterback. I forget he's not a quarterback anywhere. He was never starting quarterback before, and he's not a starting quarterback afterwards. They drafted Mitch Trubisky the year that they had him. They've had Andy Dalton playing. It's just been abysmal and now it's fields all of that having been said you gotta take a breather here on justin fields i'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why number number one is he is he is known for what he is threatening to do on the ground and when your offensive coordinator schemes up four design run plays through two weeks that's bad that's not good His vision has been awful on the field. I'm not making excuses for him here because he has to be better better with that. But I think a big part of it is that they talk to him and are like, we need you to be a pocket pet. We need you to stand inside the pocket. Like you need to, and they sort of beat that into his brain. I don't think he's having a fun. I mean, I know none of them are having fun, but like, I don't think this organization is doing the talent of Justin Fields any justice by keeping him in the system and spoon feeding him bad advice on how to be a quarterback in the NFL. I let him roll out, let him get a little creative, let him let him let him fuck up and throw some picks. Just let him put the ball in the air with DJ Moore. That's all I'm saying. At this rate with how he played, you might as well just flip the script on the opposite side of the spectrum and say like, dude, just put it up. Just put a 50-50 ball up there occasionally for your best receiver that we paid that we that we traded away a first pick to get um so that you could you know, have some confidence in your ability and let, let DJ Moore shoulder some of that because he should chase Claypool. There was so much freaking up and down with him in that game. Uh, I, you know, the interception, I felt like the one that fields through to him, like he did fight a little bit for it. I mean, there's just other plays where he's just like not there. And I felt like all the pivotal moments included chase Claypool. The touchdown was fantastic. Um, I just want to see him more motivated, but I also think that, you know, it's tough to not make excuses for the quarterback. Sorry for the rant. It's t- the offensive line did very well protecting. He had a lot of time this past game. He did not have a lot of time week one. So you're on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. Also, Todd Bowles rushes more or blitzes more than any other uh, coach in the NFL blitzes. So there was a ton of pressure on fields. And quite frankly, I felt like half the time they didn't do a good job accounting for those blitzes. So. All that having been said, Peel's team, Justin Fields, I know he's shopping him. I, I think Fields is going to be fine. Remember, it took six or it took it was like game seven or game six of last year that Justin Fields, you're like, oh, that's the guy. OK, cool. So like, let's hope we get that again. Um, the last matchup that I've got here is Pontiac Bandits and Fuga going deep. Uh, you got Trevor Lawrence and Justin Herbert. I like Justin Herbert against Minnesota. We already talked about uh, that matchup is is nice. Uh, I'm on say Brown versus Garrett Wilson. I, I'm on say Brown. I think Garrett Wilson's really talented, but you, you know what happened there. So uh, Zay Jones uh, and Debo Samuel. I like Debo way over Zay Jones, uh, Joe Mixon, uh, Jamar Gibbs. Love me some Jamar Gibbs. I like the situation he's in now. I just don't know that Detroit is going to try to use him as a bell cow while Montgomery gets better. It'll be interesting to see, but I have Joe Mixon because they're playing the Rams here. Um, James Conner and AJ Dillon. This one's interesting to me. It's it's James Conner for me any other day. But I go Dillon on this one. And and quite frankly, it's because of the Aaron Jones injury and they're playing the Saints, not Dallas Cowboys. So I, I just have to lean that direction. The worst team in the well, the second worst team, because the Bears are the worst team in the league. You got the second worst team in the league going up against the best defense in the league. And AJ Dillon, who's playing the the Saints. I'll take I'll take AJ Dillon on that. Mark Andrews was my tight end number two for Dallas Goddard. It's a good matchup as far as tight ends are concerned. And then Najee Harris and Jordan Addison. Um, Najee's concerning me now. He has had 16 attempts through two weeks, and he has under 100 yards. Um, he's gotten 
five targets total. He's gotten three catches of those five, and they're for no yards this past week, and then it was for two yards the previous week, and he has no touchdowns all year. Um, he's he's five and a half. I you just you know I th- I think. The best comparison I have to make also, I got to give credit to Peel for this because this is a good way to have put it. It's like the Tony Pollard, Ezekiel Elliott situation where you're just like the guy behind him is doing better. Now, I just wonder what the Steelers are going to do with that information. The fantasy community was onto it prior to the season. We thought that Najee was spent. Uh, and they're like, oh, I just don't understand. It's such a good first year. It's like, well, yeah, Ben Roethlisberger in his, in his, you know, twilight years was the king of check down passes to Najee. So a lot of it was just like, PPR fantasy production. I don't think he was a prolific, but he was so good in college too, which is a bummer. But um, yeah, not to knock on on the team. I still I still take Najee over Jordan Addison if that makes you feel any better. I think the big play capability is with Jordan Addison, but I think I think uh, the consistency is uh, weirdly enough. Having said that, I think the consistency is with Najee on this. Um, and then Romeo Dobbs and Austin Eckler. Look, obviously Eckler if he plays, and I think you know uh, Sean's going to have the ability to pivot here. He's got. Brees Hall on his bench right now. Uh, Traylon Burks, if if Hopkins isn't going to play, which I think Hopkins will play because he played this past week. Um, there are there are definitely some options there, so I think I think there's plenty to be done there. So I actually give the edge to uh, Sean if he puts in Brees Hall here. We'll just assume that. Also worth noting that Sean has Justin Herbert and Anthony Richardson uh, on his team. So Anthony Richardson in concussion protocol will not play this upcoming week, but I still think you play. Herbert here. So uh, another interesting thing is how this league migrated to two quarterbacks, like everyone hanging on to them all of a sudden. So those are your, those are your matchups for this week. Just to state who I think is going to win that game. I think that uh, um, I think that Sean is going to win this game over, over Ryan, unfortunately, but I have it really close. I have it really close. 116 uh, to 116. I think Ryan's going to lose by a fraction of a point. I think it's going to be 116.7 to 116.4 just to, to to really mess with the dynamic here. But a lot does depend on what you're going to do with uh, with Eckler, assuming Eckler sits. Eckler plays, you play him. He, he's your best talent on a team. Uh, that's what you got to do. So those are, those are the standings uh, as they are right now. Um, those are the matchups this week. That is the recap from week one. This is a recap from week two. Let's very quickly look into projections for what I think the rest of the year looks like based on what's happened so far. Um, I think in first place in the league right now, going into the playoffs is going to be kickers or people too. It's a two and oh, I think you come away with a nine and five record right now. Your playoff odds are looking pretty good. Hans Bowman is sort of in that same boat. One and one record uh, thrice crown menace is the same thing. Uh, Will a new name help? I think is also going to make the playoffs. And then I think we go Bone City. And then here's my drop off. This is where things get tougher for me because the sixth spot is the last playoff spot. I think it goes to Fuga going deep. And then I think I think we go uh, Blood Brothers. And then I think we go Pontiac Bandits. I think you I think you turn it around and then Camper Dude and then uh, Hunter Biden's laptop uh, ends up in la- sorry Hunter Biden's laptop ends up in last place. So um, that's that's what I have on for right now. Um, if we're, if we're looking at projected standings, if we're looking at rest of season power rankings, the injuries really threw a bunch out disproportionately. Um, I've got will a new name help and Hans Bowman are both top in my power rankings for this year. And bone city jumps up a few spots as well. And I, I got myself moved back to four. Um, you know, if you're looking at what the actual, you know, bench is looking like now mine has been pretty roughed up in two weeks so and they're multi-week injuries that i have to deal with before buys happen so i have to play teams with my backups going up against everybody's starters until the buys start to hit so i i think that's tougher that's why i moved myself back to to four in the power rankings um kickers are people too and i are tied in the in the power rankings so we're tied for four um pontiac bandits at six Blood Brothers at seven, Hunter Biden's laptop at eight, Fuku going deep at nine, and Camper Dude in in last place. So um, there, it's not a big margin from the hundred mark that we're at though. We're going from a hundred for the first two teams to um, 
Bone City at a 98 strength to uh, Thrice Crime Menace and Kickers are People 2 at a 96 strength, uh, all the way down to Camper Dude who ends up at 84, right? So we know fantasy is whatever you make it. What I'm telling you is all bullshit anyway. Uh, you know, um, just play with your heart. That's all I can tell you, but play players. So that is going to do it for me. Uh, I hope you moderately enjoyed this podcast I actually started recording this earlier in the day and then children just absolutely messed up everything as they as they do although maybe i shouldn't go on record saying i love i love you addison and emma you're you're the best uh i am still looking for a special guest sean is my only volunteer so we'll have to coordinate some time uh in the in the next week here to do the next podcast uh but if you are interested in joining the podcast i would love to uh, get together with you and I will share some show notes with you and we'll go through some topics. So uh, that having been said, good luck on your week three matchups. They start in two days. Good luck on the waivers, which process overnight tonight. Uh, friendly reminder too about waivers since I've been asked Yahoo is not as sophisticated as some of the other platforms. So I've noticed on like ESPN, you can, if you're the commissioner, you have the ability to adjust certain uh, things. So you, you can adjust waivers a certain way. Uh, on Yahoo, you cannot without manual entry, and I refuse to have that level of touch point as the commissioner, not letting it eat up that much of my time. Um, so you can put in a waiver, to be clear, and I, this is all posted in the bylaws too. You can put in a waiver just like you traditionally would at pre in previous seasons. You don't have to put any money on your waiver spend. It could be a $0 waiver. The difference is that there's a fab budget associated with it. So if you really want the person and someone bids money, they're going to get them. So like, let's say, for example, I'm just using a name. Let's say Austin Eckler is on the waiver wire. Which why Why would he? But for the example, um, if I bid $25 for Austin Eckler, which I'd be an idiot to have to bid my entire budget. But again, neither here nor there. 25 bucks, Austin Eckler, I bid 25. And you bid 25 for Austin Eckler. It's a tie. We have a rolling waiver priority, just like we would in previous seasons, that will that will dictate who is next in line to get the guy, and that is the decision maker on that. So if I'm number four in that and, and you're number three in that and we're the only two people that bid, you will win the tying bid because your waiver order was higher. You'll go back to 10 in the waiver order and I'll move up one spot if no one else bid on anything else, but I'll move up according to uh, the rolling waiver priority there. So you do not have to put in a dollar amount to collect a waiver. It will adjust your waiver priority when you do that. In addition to that, you should spend your fab budget because you have it. You can't take it with you after the season. You might as well just spend it. And if you think a guy is going to be the guy, you spend that money. And I think towards the earlier weeks too, just friendly advice for people that haven't done fab before. You typically want to spend a percentage of your budget and your budget is going to be based on how much money you have left, obviously. So, you know, 10% of 150, you're spending $15 on a guy. But once you have, you know, $15 less, once you have 135, 15% of that is less than 15 bucks. So like your 30% spend on that is not going to be as much as somebody else. And that's just a general rule of thumb I use to bid on stuff. And I think you have to live in a world where you're content if you don't get a guy. But I also think that if you think that you found the diamond in the rough off the waiver wire, you just go for it because you're either going to make it or break it with your pick anyway. So, um, you know, to give you a good example of that, um, the, the uh, Puka Nakua, right? He's, he is that guy for me week one where, I look at it and I'm like, holy cow, what a great week one. Yeah, I want to put in a waiver for this guy because I think he's going to be special and I don't know what's going on with Cooper Cup. And if he gets this many targets week one and did what he did, like, yeah. Um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to overspend on the guy to get the guy. I understand spending your whole budget on him because he's super talented. And I think I made the wrong move not by spending more. So I'm not trying to justify like my action and not getting him. My concerns with with things like that in situations like Puka Nakua is what's going to happen when Cooper Cup comes back? Because Robert Woods was on that team and he was also a very good wide receiver and he just got absolutely faded because Cooper Cup is that good. So that's that's why I didn't like spend more on him. But, you know, if you have like 
Nick Chubb just went down for the full season. If his backup was on the bench, uh, or I'm sorry, if the backup was, was on the free agency market on the waiver wire, you know, I think there's an argument to say you blow 80 bucks on a guy like that. If you need a starting workhorse running back, um, you know, and that's, that's a judgment call you make. Like, is it worth that? Do you, you know, you don't know. There's still talks about like Cam Akers getting traded about them looking into other guys. There's all these Kareem Hunt rumors that are going around, but they're not founded in anything. Stefanski already came out and said that this guy is going to be, uh, you know, the workhorse back. Like those are his words, but that's coach shock and coach shocks bullshit. So I always think it's something else. So uh, the Jeffs picked up Kareem Hunt this week before the injury happened. Now it's a matter of like, who else could they potentially ship in it and use uh, this week. And I, I just don't know. So again, with the waiver wire, you just got to use your best judgment, but the money that you bid is the money that you spend. So I'll give you another example. If I bid $10 for a guy and you bid 22 for a guy, you're not going to get that guy for $11. You're going to get that guy for $22. Whatever you think the guy is worth is the amount of money that you're going to spend. So if you say 22, it's 22. If you're the winning bid and you're never going to know what the next lowest bid was. So you got to live in a world where you're comfortable with the amount of money that you're putting down. And I, I tend to play a little bit more conservative. So, um, you know, just got to think about calls like that. If you, like, again, if you think you found the diamond in, uh, in the rough with like Puka Nakua, which is the only example I can come up with right now, just blow the budget, just, just blow the house. I think it was a great get last week getting Puka for what, for what, uh, uh, what he went for, which was, um, uh, let's see. I think I think the Jeffs got him, uh, and they got him for. Well, let's see, they got one hundred and thirteen left, so one fifteen to or one fifty minus one thirteen. So I mean, you know, going over Fab budget now, we've got uh, everybody pretty much sitting at about one fifty, one forty nine, something like that, and then we've got one ninety one team and and one one forty five team, which you know, I'll be honest too. Uh, the hope was that fab, the reason we in, implemented this system was to reduce the amount of actual impactful pickups that people could do this year. Um, you know, the whole thing was to combat the free agency pickups that would happen early in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, like the timing of that stuff is not going to change and there still is free agency. We haven't in, in Yahoo's format. There's just no workaround for that unless I get more involvement, which I have asked this in the past and I have, I have not had volunteers uh, to do this, but like I would like to have this league be managed by more than just me. I'd like somebody to take over the money management side of things. I'd like somebody to take over the waiver side of things to make sure I'd like people to be involved with the trade committee uh, we had no volunteers for the trade committee again this year. So I had picked Carlos and Peel, which was funny because Carlos and I are involved in the first trade and Peel is the only one that has to approve it. Peel's having remorse on this, this go through. So it became an issue. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on improving everything. And you guys should know that by now I'm, I'm going to be fully transparent. Like, the, the trade committee, it, I am technically not a part of. I, it is for the two uh, decision makers, which is Peel and Carlos, to decide what happens in a three-way situation where if the, the way the trade committee has always functioned, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm saying this properly. Um, if Brett and Jeff are in a trade, then Carlos and Peel would get together because I'm not part of the trade committee. They would decide whether or not that trade that the other owners made is collusion. If it's detrimental to the league or collusion, those are the two. Uh, those are the two things that I I lean on. Is it a is it a lopsided trade for like Justin Jefferson for Jacoby Myers? Okay, because one of them is a. Uh, WR one and the other guy is is just pr pretty good. Um, I think it's tough to make that call, but I do think a trade like that would impact the integrity of the league. I think I think if 
And I'm also open to, and I want this, I want this to go on record too. I'm also very open to going back to the veto system. The reason we eliminated that in the past is because I think everybody was just like, I want all trades to kind of go through unless they're detrimental to the league or collusion. But then we had people that would just vote no because if it didn't help their team, they want your team, you know, that so we we took it out. And also I think that process just took too long of like it was a two day waiting period followed by a two day processing period. So it was a four day swing and like, you're not even going to get the guys until the following week. And then if there was an injury that happened, there's just a lot that would go wrong in a situation like that. So I wanted, I wanted trades to be more agile. If you're making a trade, it means you want the guy. Now you kind of get the guy now Uh trade committee to go back to in that situation, whereas Brett and Jeff, Peel and Carlos would get together. They'd make the decision. They'd inform me that they've approved it or denied it, and I will either decline it or approve. Uh, they have they have twelve hours to do so. Um, they don't. They they have twenty four hours as like an extended thing if they need to have like a, a bigger conversation about it. But they have twelve hours to approve your trade within reason. Like at six at night to six in the morning, or eight at night to eight in the morning. Obviously not. Um, so those are your extenuating circumstances where it go up to twenty four. But like there's a Thursday night game going and you want a guy in there. Like we got to make sure that we talk and um, you know, that's where Peel and Carlos would get together and, and then inform me of the decision. If someone on the trade committee is involved with a trade. So let's say Carlos is trading with Brett. Then Peel would need to make the decision on his own and inform me what that decision was. Okay. So it's, it's totally up to Peel in that situation. What, that trade is going to be whether or not it's approved or denied vice versa for him as well uh again keeping in mind collusion and maintaining the integrity of the league these are decisions that you all as adults have to make and it's it's uh i understand it's been a point of contention in the past because like we've declined trades like we've declined travis kelsey for tyler higby but uh i don't I don't regret that decision at all. Having done that in the past, I would do that again in a heartbeat today because you're looking at the overall tight end one versus a guy that was uh, had two good weeks and historically bad weeks. Now, and I hate to say that stuff too. Like I really do hate to say that um, because like, who am I to say those sorts of, th of things? And I understand the argument on the other side. Like, yeah, if you're saying, who are you to say that sort of stuff? What gives you the right? But I I've dealt with, with the backlash from every owner in this league, just about. Um, and I, I just heard too many sides of, of other arguments to, you know, I have to use my best judgment in situations like that. So I get it and, and you hate it sometimes. And I, I, I don't doubt it, but um, until we, until we can get, you know, um, you know, more people to volunteer for stuff like that. It's just kind of the way that things are right now. The the last thing on trades is let's say in this like last situation where Carlos and I were in a trade, it's Peel's sole decision to make whether or not the trade gets processed. Um, and in that situation, I mean, I love trading, so I will I will go into what happened. We were all on Discord, all three of us were on Discord. Peel started talking about trades with Carlos, and I sort of weaseled my way into the conversation. It's like, what would it take for you to part with Hertz? Because like right now. I have Aaron Rodgers and this was prior to week one. I was like, I just want to upgrade the position. Like you auto drafted, like, what are you looking for? And he was like, well, running backs. And if you know anything about me, I typically go heavy in the running back category. And I was like, what would it take for you to part with Hertz? And like, he was like, well, I don't want Jonathan Taylor. Like I'm nervous. He may not come back for the rest of the year. And I was like, I'll take the risk. I was like, I will take the risk on Jonathan Taylor. And I, you know, it's a Le'Veon Bell situation. Maybe this guy does not come back. Um, Carlos is like, I need two, two starters, Kenneth Walker and Seattle produces really good running back. So I think he's like low end RB one, high end RB two territory for me. That's how I drafted him. If Carlos values him higher, Carlos values, values him higher. I mean, Chris Carson produced really well there. I've seen Rashad Penny produced well there when he was healthy. So like, if you think the Seattle system produces good running backs, it's totally your call. So, um, Carlos wanted Kenneth Walker. And then I wanted to give Javante Williams, but, he had concerns about Javante Williams injury history and rightfully so. Like uh, I totally get it. Cause it's the same injury JK Dobbins had and he's on a faster return timeline than Dobbins was. So, um, you know, I took it in the case that, 
you know, Javante does produce neither here nor there. That's not what he wanted. So he just kind of like went down the list and he didn't want Rashad white. And he ended up being comfortable with uh, Khalil Herbert. The reason I'm kind of telling you this story is if you guys aren't on the trade, if you are on the trade committee, we are not privy to those conversations that happen outside of the trade committee, nor should we be, nor do we need to be. You don't need to justify why you think you're you're making your team better. We just have to look at it from a from an objective lens and say, is this detrimental to the integrity of the league? Meaning, is it? You know, I number broken record here. I get it. I've said it a couple of times. But is this is this your Justin Jefferson for? you know, somebody because you're frustrated that Justin Jefferson gave you two bad weeks and you just want somebody that had two good weeks that's not the guy? Or is this like, hey, I'm upgrading you at the running back position and you're upgrading me at the wide receiver position? Like, trade committee is not really in a position to evaluate like what increases the value of another team. On paper, it looks like my side of the trade is better because we know Justin Hurts and we know Jonathan Taylor, but like, We don't know Jonathan Taylor's situation. Carlos had Joe Burrow and wanted Joe Burrow. He wanted to keep Joe Burrow. I wanted Joe Burrow on the trade. He he wanted to keep Joe Burrow. So like, this is how things ended up. Um, And again, like you're not privy to those conversations. The, The only thing that I can, I can tell you is when you are doing trades, do your due diligence, talk to multiple owners, shop your trade around a little bit and come back. And I mean, use you know, the art of the deal, use the art of the deal. Did negotiate a little bit too, right? Like I love making trades. I've done it every year since I've been in this league. I've not, I've never not made a trade in, in, in a, in a season. Um, I just, I love it. I, I, I live for it. I breathe it. I would encourage you guys to do the same. Um, you know, let's, let's have an honest, open conversation about what trades look like in this league right now and evaluate if we're doing it right we are allowed to make mid season change. As long as we have a majority, we're allowed, you're allowed to uh, introduce one rule change during the season uh, per owner. So every owner is allowed to introduce one rule change per season that gets voted on. And I would encourage you if you want changes in the way that we're doing trades to introduce that um, during the year. And we will change it. We will change it right there on the spot. If, and when it wins out, um, so that is sort of my my rant about trades. Um, I encourage all of you to get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, the document that has the bylaws on it also has everybody's numbers. So uh, I, I know I've heard, uh, again, just coming from, from Peel since I was talking to him more recently, that his complaint was that I talked to everybody in the league because, you know, I know everybody. Well, no shit. We all know each other. In addition to that, the bylaws, everyone, everyone's numbers on there too. So like, not only is there the group me set up, not only do you have the email chains going, you've got everyone's phone number. You could pick up a phone, you could call, you could text, you could organize these things on your own. You also, a lot of us see each other in person often. So like, you just got to keep the lines of communication open. And um, I think, you know, if you fail at getting somebody to contact you one way, does not mean that you shouldn't try another way. Pick up a phone, call people old school, uh, you know, like uh, Mick's not going to listen to this podcast, but do you really think Mick is going to check the group me for you making a trade proposal and you trying to talk to him about it? It's just not his method of communication. You got to pick up a phone and call him and just be like, hey, Mick, it's me, Brett. We're in the fantasy league together. Do you have a minute? I wanted to talk to you about a trade. I thought you'd be interested. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen is you're not going to get a trade done, but at least you at least you tried. So. Okay, officially the end of my rant. Um, everybody have a good week three. I know I said this, but we're back on it. Have a good week three. Enjoy football. The injuries suck. We're all dealing with it right now. We're going to continue to deal with it. Um, but have fun and good luck to everybody coming up in week three. And we'll see you for the week four podcast. Hopefully there will be more than just one of me. Have a good one.